Rugby World Cup 2023 pool phase has come to an end, and it did so in the most exciting way possible with Portugal getting their first ever World Cup win against Fiji. Today, we discuss that fallout as well as looking ahead to one of the most exciting quarterfinal matchups in World Cup history. Joining myself and the columnist to preview all four fixtures is Rugby Hall of Famer David Campesi. Before we kick off this episode of the pod, I just wanted to give a shout out to our friends at Keith Prowse, the UK's leading provider of corporate hospitality experiences. Did you know that they have been offering hospitality experiences at Twickenham since 1979? So they know a thing or two on this. They've got an incredible selection of official hospitality experiences, ranging from a live band, plenty of Guinness on tap, legendary players doing the rounds, some of the best seats in the house to watch the game, and loads more. So if you've got a special occasion coming up that you want to celebrate or a key client you're desperate to impress, make sure you get in touch with Keith Prowse by visiting their website, keithprowse.co.uk forward slash Twickenham. I've heard that they're almost sold out of their island packages already for next year's Guinness Six Nations, so I suggest that you guys hurry. The pool stage is finally wrapped up after the Rugby World Cup's fifth round of fixtures at the weekend. Quarter final weekend is looming. It's looking pretty damn tasty. First things first, let's look back at the weekend. The headline, and Brendan, I'm going to come straight to you because your beloved Portugal, they did it. Yeah, they did, didn't they? I mean, what a fabulous match. Um that, that was almost rugby paradise. I mean, Toulouse, for me, is the centre of the rugby universe anyway. It's sort of southwest France. It's where it all radiates from. You know, Sunday night in October, sun setting on the Pink City. Portugal and Fiji really laying on a feast. Uh, brilliantly refereed, I thought, by Luke Pierce. I know I have a go at ref sometimes, but I thought he was excellent. And actually, even I had given up on the win. I thought, well, what a fantastic bucky performance. Uh, Fiji have somehow, again, just about quarried this one out and then you know we should I shouldn't have lost faith because off they dashed down the right hand touch line Storty and Marta fantastic try uh fantastic scenes uh everything the World Cup should be that match yeah match of the World Cup Nick will go with Nick Powell oh 100 yeah um it was it was so entertaining I mean you know, I've done a few of those games because, you know, uh, when the paper gets released on the Sunday, I sort of do a lot of stuff on the website throughout the day and then, you know, have to keep the keep the match boards coming in from the Sunday games. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like reluctant to be staying up for it in the first instance. But then I sent something through uh, to a group chat being like, oh, this is such an entertaining game. And it was half time at three all and one of my mates sort of came back and said, are you, are you being ironic? Are you being sarcastic? And it, it absolutely wasn't. It was just so end to end. It was great to see Fiji playing with such um, with such freedom, given the fact that you know had they actually lost by eight points, it would have been it would have been very damaging. But clearly, they they wanted to go out there and express themselves in their last group game, and and Portugal, you know, everything seemed to come together for Portugal, um, and and to do it as well after. It was, you know, they went 10-3 up. They went on the attack to make it 17-3, basically. They were one pass away from getting that second try. And then and then Fiji were on the length of the field and scored. And for them to pick themselves back up and go, no, this isn't going to be another near miss. We're going to do it this time. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I I I, I sort of agree with um with with from the Portuguese side of things and from for a sense of occasion. And the sense of a a, a new um, rugby nation really having a, a arrived. Um, I used to go to the Lisbon Sevens way back in the you know in the in the in the nineteen nineties, and uh, to see where they've come from is fantastic. And their, their turnaround at the end, I I agree. You know, to counter punch immediately after they'd all, almost been knocked out was uh, was was phenomenal. The sense of occasion because of their fans um, was, you know, was electric. But I thought Fiji were headless. I thought that for a lot of the game, they were uh, really very poor. And it almost seems to me as if they've, they've regressed in some ways during the, <laughs> since their, since their win at Twickenham, Twickenham uh, because I, I thought that their handling was, you know, was really harem scarum. Um, I thought that they tried to uh, to muscle uh, uh, Portugal for long periods of the game, 
and actually didn't manage to. The Portuguese defence was fantastic for most of the game. Um, and I and in, incidentally, Brent, I take just you know a, a different, slightly different view on Luke Pierce's performance. He needs to be quieter. He talks non-stop, and he's he's almost having a dialogue with every player on the pitch at times. I mean, you know, I mean, I I really do think that there's a point where referees have to have some gravitas. Uh, so. Um, uh, I, I wasn't entirely surprised to see him out of the mix for the quarterfinals. I don't know what that means for his chances um, going forward. Um, but, uh, yeah, a fantastic occasion. I thought Fiji were, I, I mean, it, they they really, if they're going to beat England, uh, they're going to have to improve on that. And that's saying something after uh, England Samoa. I would agree totally on Fiji running out of steam a bit. And, what we forget here is that they had two massive warm-up matches. Now, to play France in France for Fiji is a big thing. It's not that big a thing for France as a World Cup warm-up match. It's a huge thing for Fiji. To come mm. to Twickenham and to beat England at Twickenham, that's a huge thing. Then they roll into a massive emotional match against Wales, which they should have won. I said, mm. oh, to this day, I think they were robbed a bit there. Then they have an absolutely definitive performance against Australia. Mm. Uh, and then ever since then, they've been hanging on a bit. A lot of emotion has gone into those big four matches. Uh, they've had the Joshua to us over up in the tragedy of the of the the sun dying, which the squad would have taken on board. I'm pretty sure that that's such a close knit group. And there has been that slight feeling that they they're running out of steam a little bit. And I don't mm. for me that didn't detract from sun from the the match against Portugal, but you sensed uh, that they could do with a bit of a lift. And then the skipper got injured, of course, as well. Um, so I don't know what they're doing this week, but they ought to just go to the beach for three or four days. They just well, need to reset mentally. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree about the mental reset. But in the previous game, they looked as if they'd been on the beach for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they... yeah, I mean, it, unbelievably, not unbelievably, England, I'm, we'll get to this in a minute. England are strong favourites. I make them against Fiji. I think Fiji might, we might have seen the best of Fiji. Mm. But nonetheless, they make, they contributed to a fine game against Portugal. They, they did, but it's it's remarkable when you actually see them resorting to Route 1 rugby through their forwards to, to, to you know, to level it up. And, um, you know... But I we mean, can't have everything. How many years have we sat here and said, if only Fiji played a slightly more conservative game occasionally? And if yeah. they had kind of months here, they'd be playing a bit more of that, I think. Well, but, so we can't have it both ways, you know. You know, I, I think that that's the biggest, um, you know, if you look at losses to teams uh, in the tournament, that he was a revelation at, yeah. at Twickenham because he... You know, tactically, he moved them around the pitch beautifully. He did all the basics at 10, you know, impeccably. And um, the the guys who've, you know, who've uh, who, who've replaced him, Botita, they just don't have the same poise at no. all. And that's the, the danger. I mean, one of the things is, is that their handling game, which is usually so, you know, phenomenally good, appears to have become unstuck. And um, but you, yeah, I mean, they are a, an absolutely quixotic team, which is what makes them box office. So you're never quite, sh <laughs> quite sure what will happen. And I'm sure that they'll um, they'll bring their their A game against England. But they do look a tired team. Yeah, you wonder if it's the favourites tag as well, because if you think about their last, well, if you include the France game, six games. The four games in which they've actually shown up, they weren't they weren't favourites in. They were the underdogs, and they can play with that freedom and sort of throw it to their opposition. Whereas obviously at the at the weekend, you got the feeling that Portugal they out Fiji Fiji effectively, and it's the sort of weight of the favourites mantle. They were poor against Georgia as well. Well, they played. Oh, yeah, they, point. They, they've played two very. I, I mean, I thought that the defensive por, uh, performances of both Georgia. And Portugal one after another against them. I mean, uh, I've been critical of them, but the you've got to give credit to the defences of those two teams because they tackled their hearts up. Let's talk about the other headline fixture from that day. Obviously, 
Nick, we were just saying off air, Sunday was the best day of the World Cup and Japan, Argentina has kind of become a little bit of a forgotten uh, phenomenon, but it was a hell of a game as well. No, that was a, such an amazing occasion. As I was saying off air as well, you know, you could tell through the TV, it, the atmosphere was unbelievable when they were playing sort of uh, Don Lesio Demily in between the uh, in between all the action whenever there was a break. Um, the, the fans from both teams were absolutely loving it, even though Japan were just about always kept at arm's length for about half an hour into the game. But, um, you know, I think from those two teams' point of view, and I don't know whether it was, it was the humidity when they played against England, maybe that had an element to do with it. And maybe playing in Nantes uh, in the middle of the day, it's a much less humid environment to play in. And, and we were later in the tournament, so the, the temperature would have been lower as well. But um, they probably were thinking what could have been in those games that they did play against England because it's not like England have a pack of forwards which is so unbelievably relentless. And the performances that both those two teams put in on Sunday from an attacking point of view were so, so, so much better than than we saw against England. Obviously, Argentina struggled in attack against Samoa as well uh, because uh, because it poured with rain in, in San Etienne in that game. Um, and, uh, and, 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 but, but from a Japanese point of view, yeah, I think, I think they will, they will look at, you know, what could have been potentially because, um, neither of those teams really caused England a problem. And when you look at the way that they played on Sunday, they absolutely should have done. With Japan, I was reading some of the Japanese press or, you know, the England tra translation, the big debate over the last four years has been how they went away from the style they played in 2019, the sort of instant, you know, thousand miles an hour passing. And Jamie Joseph was trying to get these big, powerful units in both the backs and the forwards. And in extremis, with the backs against the wall, elimination almost certain, they went back to their old style, I thought, on Sunday and looked so much better. You know, they, that is the DNA of Japanese rugby. That's how they need to play it. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And uh, there might be an element with, with Jamie Joseph, actually, where... Um, with the with with the kind of COVID situation, when you when you're playing that sort of style of rugby, not in the same way as Ireland, but like Ireland, you have to have super cohesion because if you're going to chuck chuck the ball around, everyone has to understand what each other's strengths are and and when each other are gonna are gonna do that sort of thing, um, and potentially with COVID because Japan played so little rugby in those first two years, he wanted to just simplify the game plan a touch, um, but as you say. When the, it, they reverted to type, but not in the kind of way that England sometimes revert to type, which is just kick the leather off the ball. Reverting to type for them was chucking the ball around, and it was great to watch. No, terrific. And, of course, it featured one of the tries of this tournament and, and one of the tries of any World Cup tournament from Fakatala. Yeah. I mean, that that was you know, made by the forwards. I mean, OK, the counter-attack was started by the back, but Michael Leach, the, the best outside centre the world's never seen, made it with the pass and then unbelievable finish unbelievable finish he's had such a good tournament league such a good tournament yeah and he was being written he's off wasn't he and yet he's been brilliant game. again yeah mm. yeah mm. sorry to see japan go they've got two centers in the pack because fakatava's played a bit of center hasn't he for his uh i forget which club he's at i didn't know that but you could certainly see you, you could see it, yeah. Might have done, yeah. yeah exactly exactly um bit of a bomb shot david have you are you there I am here. Sorry, guys. I'm driving my car, so I hope that's okay. <laughs> if you want, just join us when you're home. Oh, well, we're... I've got to take my son to school, so I thought I might as well just come and listen to you guys so I can listen. And then, so I want to hear what you guys, experts say. Okay. I come in, you know, saying the wrong thing, so I've got to be on the same page as you guys. Okay. All right. So are you going to be home and dry, and then we'll talk about Australia properly in 15, 20 minutes. Oh, mate, we need about five days to talk about Australia, not 15 minutes. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, hope this makes, I hope this makes the edit, by the way. I, I guess it's going to happen. No, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> Those of you who are confused, is... David Campisi has just phoned in <laughs> from the school run. <laughs> oh, dear. I'll, so... I'll, I'll dial back in. Yeah, okay. do you uh, dial back in okay. when you're home? Okay, we'll do. It. See you guys. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.
I was about just, he had just messaged me to say he was coming in 15, 20 minutes. So I was about to interrupt the Japan Argentina. Um, there's your U turn listening at, at home. We didn't, well, we did think we had a special guest then. Campo had a last minute thing come up. And now he, he said that he can very kindly drop in. So we will have um, him to come in and talk about the other headline from the weekend, which is Australia's first ever pool stage exit. So do stay tuned for that. Um, I can't really remember where we were now. We were talking about... We were, we were talking about Sunday, and I think you were <laughs> going to do a very smooth transition into Wales, Argentina, maybe off the back of that. And, and your, your plans completely thrown out yeah, by that, that little I, interjection. I actually wasn't, to be honest. I was going to... because Well, we're still on the reflections um, side of things. I don't want to look ahead to the quarters just yet. I want to look at England, Samoa, and mainly England. Um that was, oh, I've got my days mixed up now. That was on Saturday. Saturday, 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 Saturday afternoon. Yeah. It was on Saturday. It, yeah. Well, Samoa should have won the game, let's be honest. A uh, couple of refereeing decisions and or just overall performance. Um, for most, and myself included, there was, there is absolutely no coincidence that the addition of Owen Farrell contributed to a more stagnant England performance. Um, is anyone going to disagree with that? Not at all. And, and in fact, I, I there were some pictures doing the, the round in the week of him playing golf with the lads. And he looked huge, Owen Farrell. He, I think he's overcompensated for not playing by getting down the gym or whatever. He looks like a bloke in the middle of a pre-season. You know, normally you, you arrive in the first match of the season absolutely ripped muscularly, but probably a stone heavier than your fighting weight. And you, and you run that off in the course of six, seven, eight matches. And by late October, you're absolutely, you know, peak fitness. So he looked a bit slow and cumbersome to me, you know, and he's, his pace is never his thing anyway. So, yeah, I thought he had a poor match. And obviously everyone remembers the shot clock um, and that was, you know, probably an instance that represented every, all the shambles that England were, but he gave two or three horrendous passes and with him at 12, he's obviously, he's he, Nick Kano, he's never going to carry and threaten the line and so there are a couple of times where he was the out the back play and sometimes the out the back play you want them to threaten the line and he just he shipped one bullet pass on to Manu Tuolangi which he then dropped and shipped one wild miss pass to I can't remember who the recipient was but we had an overlap and butchered it completely because it was three or four yards behind him yeah you know I mean the 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 dilemma that Borthwick has got is Borthwick remembers you know that the, the great template is uh, England's performance against New Zealand four years ago in uh, in Yokohama, where Ford Farrell did work. But on other occasions, it, it didn't. And it didn't work in the final um, uh, against South Africa, which was the definitive performance of the, uh, of the World Cup. And um, I, I do think that going back to it, particularly with Farrell, you know, ring rusty, which is what he is, you know, um, uh, was is 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 a mistake, and it must have been, you know, you see, you see Ford pulled off after fifty minutes, and he's just made a uh, a, a try saving tackle uh, by you, you know backtracking. It must have been very very difficult for him. Uh, you know, given the narrative in the World Cup up to now. It is one of those things where, it, it, you know, I mean, they're both very good distributors. They're tactically, if they're on song, they're both uh, good tactical kickers. But it does blunt England. There's no question about it. It does blunt England. And if everything's joined up outside them very well, cross kicks, so on and so forth, it can work. And has worked very well in the past, but um, if if they're not functioning well as a unit, and they and they didn't, you know, the link between uh, Ford and Farrell was okay, but Farrell outside uh, to Tuilagi didn't really work, and the so Samoans had got, um, you know, had obviously got, got their their torpedo lock on um, on on Manu as well. Uh, so it was a, you know, it's, he has to go back to picking one or other of them at fly half. And at the moment of the two of them in this World Cup, the form fly half is George Ford. 
I was yelling at the TV at about 50 minutes when I can't remember what the score was, but it was certainly a close game. Um, substitution gets made, Marcus Smith comes on, and it's for George Ford and not for Owen Farrell. Do we think, oh, sorry to interrupt, Ollie, but do yeah, we well, think that there's a possibility that? George Ford was being subbed off to keep himself to keep him fit for the quarterfinal. That the decision was virtually already made that George Ford was going to play the quarterfinal by that point, and they gave Farrell a chance to potentially prove himself in the last half hour. Uh, but the guy who has played in all four games was taken off um, just to keep his legs fresh. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very, sort of Nick, it's, out it's, a, it's a very interesting theory. <laughs> I'm 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 very unconvinced by it. But, Overly but, optimistic, but, would you could say? Could be right. I, I, you know, who who knows? But I um, I, I don't think so. I think that. I mean, uh, I know we were behind, but it didn't. The there were no consequences to losing. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I just I thought that I thought there might that might be a possibility. Well, my um, initial thought wasn't that. That's been my thought since. Is oh maybe he was actually giving Ford a rest. I don't know. Hopefully. I mean, that, that's exactly that's exactly what I was about to ask. Um, you know, it's been a funny old pool, Nick, um, and it all hinged on that first match for England. You know, given their preparation, given that Tom Curry was off the park after ninety seconds or whatever, or two minutes to win that match in the manner they did, looking back was extraordinary. That was actually one of the performances of the World Cup, but it completely flattened their pool campaign from from that moment onwards. They were basically through. And I, 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 and it's all dulled minds a bit. I think. I think they thought, okay, we're okay. We're in the quarterfinals. We've got three matches to work it out. And I'm not sure they have really worked it out. And I'm not. I don't know what the England team is still. I mean, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen. I mean, what is the England team? They seem to change and move it around. Uh, and if they're not convinced themselves, yeah. um, they're going into a match without that sort of assurance and surety. Easiest pool of all time. What do you reckon? Yeah. New Zealand in 2007 had a, a pretty <laughs> poor Scotland, poor I, Italy. I, 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 I hesitate with I like, hesitate with these sort of um, uh, superlatives. <laughs> it's got to be right up there, hasn't it? You know, the mean, fact that Argentina didn't show up on the first match made it. Yeah, the absolute, fact that neither yeah. of England's two two hardest games really bothered yeah, to show up. It. The yeah. didn't hit the heights that some had predicted for them. Um, yeah. And it was amazing to have Chile at the tournament, but it is Chile at the end of the day. Um, yeah, uh, England, England, you know. It's, they it's haven't had to concentrate the mind much, have they, England? It's, they it's, really it's, just... Um, yeah, talk, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the in, in the rugby paper columns about like a world trophy or a play. If you compare Pool D and Pool B, it looks like a world trophy pool versus a world cup pool. <laughs> 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 and now it's, I and now they're yeah. going to play a team that just lost to Portugal. Yeah. Crack. I mean, I mean, uh, the one thing please the entertainment's I, been decent. The one thing that I would say is that if you if you didn't have your England hat on, I mean, Samoa's performance against England was at times absolutely scintillating. You know, they played some fantastic rugby, um, you know, counter-attacking from deep. Uh, they were linked up in a way that England weren't. Um you know they 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 were they were and and it was such a transformation as well from their previous games. Yeah, well they they looked a lot better with Sopoanga at ten. I thought mm. I don't think Leo Lea Fano. I was a bit mystified that he hadn't been starting from the off. To be honest, yeah, I mean, me. you know, Lea Lea Fano, a pretty handy. Landing, wasn't landing a kick and and couldn't manage the game in open play. I just couldn't uh, understand that. How good was Theo stuff. McFarlane? By the way, he confirmed everything. We thought about him, and how good was N nine on the day? Who, who sort of spluttered around the first yeah. couple of matches? Yeah, yeah, although he he has always been throwing himself into the action in every single game. I think yeah. he he every single game he's attempted about twenty five tackles and missed about ten. <laughs> yeah. but he's made fifteen at the end of the <laughs> yeah, game. Yeah. So you know, he's he's, he's a, such a live wire. So he, good to watch. I do think that we need to uh, sound one note of uh, of of certainly. Um, congratulations. I mean, Danny Kerr, sitting on the bench, had obviously weighed up what he could do, and he went out and did it for all of, I don't know how many minutes it was, probably about 15, something like that. But he pulled off 
um, you know, he, 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 he forced McFarland into pulling off a, a, a try saving tackle almost as soon as he came on. Then he scored a good try, you know, by going open. Um, and, uh, and then obviously the tackle, uh, at, at the end on the Samoan winger. Um, does he start now, Nick? Has he done enough to start? Or is he best uh, off the weird, bench? You know, he's always been, there's always been an element of Danny where he's a super sub. And I, you know, I, I think, you know, over the, across the full 80, sometimes he, he, especially now, um, you know, given it, given the fact that he's the oldest man on the pitch normally, I, I think that he, he, he'd possibly struggle over 80, which, um, may not be surprising you know but he certainly you know you you'd have to say at the moment he's probably the uh, the form scrum are yeah yeah before storm camper arrives i reckon we do our sort of review of the pool stage now and by that i want a we've kind of already agreed on the match of the pool stage um let's get a player of the pool stage and a moment of the pool stage from everyone pool phase sorry i think they're calling it not pool stage uh brendan i'll come to you for either first if anything comes to mind so that was that was player and moment yeah player and moment player um i'm gonna go with um samuel marks although i heard him pronounce marches at one stage i'm not sure the correct pronunciation A great warrior eight french clubs i think he has in his career Last man to be the scrum off at toulouse before dupont he had such a good world cup and he was on one leg um, coming into the World Cup with injury uh, and struggling a bit. I thought, you know, he he was the brain that kept Portugal going. And, of course, he was the man who kicked the goal to give him the win, just as he was the man who kicked the goal to get them into the World Cup in the last minute uh, in the repercharge. So what what a fantastic tournament for him. In fact, for you know, for both the oldies in the team, Mike Tadger had another fine match. But he, he was certainly my player of the tournament, a uh, player of the, the round. And, and moment would probably be um, actually, let's go Fakatava's try. That was so special to see that uh, come from nowhere. That you, we need to note that. Yeah. So you're picking. That's for the entire pool pool phase uh, part of every week. Oh, they, oh, we're doing the entire. We're pool. doing the entire. Yeah, we're doing the entire. Yeah. Well, I'd, no, I'm still going to go with Portugal, and I've backed them all the way. So let, let, let's go yeah. with that. But Fakatava's try was the try of the the pool. I think. Okay. All right. Great stuff. Um, let's go, Kano. Um, well, look. I mean, looking at the uh, at the at the sort of uh, top end of it, I guess uh, Ireland in the pool stages, having um, seen off South Africa and, and Scotland, and I think that um, a player of the pool stages. I think Hugo Keenan is a fantastic, um, uh, a, a, a sort of uh, jack in a box really for Ireland. I mean, they're very, very structured in what they do and so on, but Keenan strikes me as, as the player who, who brings an electricity to, um, to what they do uh, very often. So I, I think I'd sort of look at him as a, um, a player of the pool stage the Portuguese story is a fantastic story. If you, if you ask me for a, for a moment of the round, I'd say Tadger's clearance into uh, <laughs> into touch was a textbook, <laughs> and for a hooker who'd been sort of in the thick of it um, for the entire uh, match to uh, to have the composure to pull it off, I thought was something something else. Been waiting uh, his entire career to do it, so yeah. So they yeah. didn't have enough leader. Okay. <laughs> yes, that entire career, but uh, what a moment! You know, what a game to uh, what a game to do it in as well. You know, I mean, he was he was in tears, ecstatic as as everybody else in the Portuguese camp <laughs> and among their supporters was when they uh, they eventually got the their first victory. Um, so yeah. Yeah, great. You know, I mean, but yeah, that's that's my uh, my call. Nick, uh, my player of the pool stages would be Jack Morgan. Uh, so far, I just think 
every game I've seen him, and I've not seen every Wales game, but every game I've seen him, he has stepped up brilliantly. And uh, the the Australia game, he was just uh, he was just unbelievable. He's going to add so much to to Welsh rugby in the next decade or so. He's going to bring he's going to inspire so many kids to continue to get involved and you know keep rugby arresting the the growth of football with the competition that goes on between those two teams in Wales now uh, those two sports in Wales now. Um, so you know I, I thought he had a, a brilliant pool stage. Uh, and then my uh, my moment would be uh, Balthazar and Maggia scoring against France for Uruguay. And the reason it's such a... You can, I can remember the moment so well. is 30 seconds later, Uruguay conceded a charge down try straight for the restart and France uh, extended the lead to eight points and the game was basically over. But up to that point, that was a game which I... That was the game which I thought was going to be the sort of 96 100 nil game. Clearly hadn't done my research well enough or or watched Uruguay enough because uh, they were they were outstanding up to that point and it was certainly I, I I hope for the teams that went on to to produce upsets a bit of inspiration for those for those tier two teams that actually any you know in the modern game with the right you know with the right tactics with the right approach any team can give any other team a run for their money. Yeah, hundred percent. I am going to go with, well, there are two players that I, well, I wanted to mention one and that's all on the basis that I thought someone else would be mentioned and he hasn't. Obviously, we kind of all know by this point how good Bundiaki has been. Ridiculous number of metres, ridiculously not, ridiculous number of carries. Um, I think he's third or fourth on the try scoring list. Um, certainly highest try scoring centre in, obviously he's, we had sort of doubts about him and his discipline and whether he was, you know, keeping a shirt warm until Robbie Henshaw was fit. That's obviously very much not the case. The other one, and I was surprised you didn't say this, um, Nick Powell, because I know how much of a fan you are of Mathieu Jalibert. And you did, you did say to me before the tournament, you were like, oh, mate, Untermax not a loss. And so far it's been pretty damn seamless. Um, one of my moments of the weekend was that crossfield kick where he kind of, got taken out and he looked like a sort of kung fu fighter while he was kicking his limbs were sort of at all corners of the pitch um and it was still pinpoint for Penno. he didn't surprise me at all though ollie so you know. <laughs> i was gonna say you no, are yourself and you look now, now he's hard. gonna put now he's gonna put in the worst performance known to man against south africa this weekend <laughs> Be, be week, shunned by like, friends with me forever. France really miss Untermac, don't they? But he's done that every time he's come back in, um, Jalibert. And, well, when Untermac does come back, that's going to be a hell of a sort of shootout for that 10 jersey. Um, moment of the pool phase, and I suppose I'm a little, little bit biased because this weekend is fresh in the memory, but one that hasn't been said is... Fiji's head coach, Simon Raiwalui, goes to the Portugal changing room after the Portugal's win with a Fiji j- jersey, presents it to them, congratulates the, um, them. And it was the most Fiji thing ever. It was the most Rugby World Cup thing ever. It was the most rugby thing ever. Um, and obviously we all saw the on-the-pitch scenes and I just thought that was a really nice behind-the-scenes moment. So, yeah. yeah that's lovely. He's such a cool customer, Simon Raiwalui. Yeah, he's a nice guy, isn't he? His yeah, tweet is really well, is well worth following. Know, he's so comfortable with what good he's doing. sense of humor. He's the daddy yeah. figure, isn't he? And he looks after yeah. him all. He's a great guy, right? Almost yep, on cue from, from, from the wilderness. Uh, he was always a difficult mm-hmm. one to hold up on the pit, hold up on the pitch. Hello, David Campesi. Hello, how are you? I'm all right, mate. How are you? <laughs> That was a well, chaos. depends because I'm I'm about to head to France tomorrow, so I'll probably watch the Wallabies come past in the air, mate. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, straight off the bat, Bad. look, we've obviously been recording for a little bit of time, so we've got I reckon yep. we've got about 15 minutes to talk about Australia. Yeah, fine. Go for it. I'm yep. just going to hand the baton to you. Obviously, presumably you're yep. watching Portugal Fiji on yep. Sunday night. How are you feeling during that game? Well, I was actually in Samoa, believe it or not. So um, I was over there for two days and uh, I was I had breakfast and I said, oh, the rugby's on. went there and I've gone, oh, I can't believe the score. And I walked off. I said, I'm not watching it. <laughs> and then I went back to watch. And, yeah, look, I, I thought, um, you know you know what? It's interesting. When you, when you play games of rugby, like 
if you look at Fiji against Wales and Australia, the way they played was amazing. Against Georgia and Portugal, they weren't because sometimes mentally you know you should win. You know, especially the Islanders, they've always done that in the history of rugby. If you have a look, they, I think uh, 2019s, I think Fiji lost to uh, Uruguay. So they sort of come down to that level instead of playing their level. Um, in the second half, obviously, the start of the second half, Fiji played a lot better, but it was just the little things that I find are still missing in, in top rugby. Um, and if you look at most teams, it's the little basic things that I don't understand that, that they can't do. If you watch All Blacks versus Italy, so France, Italy, France are losing by, sorry, Italy's losing by 50. They get the ball and they kick it away. And I've gone, guys, uh, you know that you are behind 50 points, so why kick the ball away to the opposition? <laughs> Every team does it. I find that absolutely stupidity, but maybe it's just me, mate. I don't know. The game of rugby has changed. There's a lot of rugby league influence. Most of the league coaches are defence coaches, and it's about defence. If you watched uh, Fiji against Portugal, they had, a, they had a penalty five metres out from the try line. They took a tap. They ended up on their 22, and they were in attack. So how does that work? Well, what, well, there's no initiative. Players do exactly what they're told to do. They've got these runners coming on and telling you how to play. I mean, it's just totally bizarre rugby. You know, if the way I look at it is rugby league in Australia has played the way rugby union used to be, and rugby union has played the way the rugby league used to be. Spiral <laughs> passing, you can't commit anybody if you spiral the pass. You know, and uh, back in the day, you run at somebody, you could run you know, probably about half a foot away from the opposition. You've got him. You've checked him. You pass the ball. You can't do that now spiral. It's about two metres. That's why they drift off. So there we go. That's my David, when you, were, when you were watching that match, Portugal-Fiji, did mm. a bit of you want Portugal to win by enough to let Australia in? Or are you so angry and agitated about the Australia situation that you think it's actually good for them to have actually been knocked out at this stage? Yeah, look, I, I think it's. I think it was the second there. I, I think Portugal, because Portugal plays some good rugby. You know, against Georgia, they did very well. But the thing is that what, why should Australia get through because they played so badly? It's just not right. You know, you, yeah. you've got to deserve. You've got to deserve. It's a World Cup. You know, the thing is, you prepare four years for a World Cup. You know, Australia prepared seven months. You know, and unfortunately, when Eddie came to Australia, you can't look. Some ways you can't blame Eddie. Um, and sometimes you can, but the problem was seven months out, he had no idea about Australian rugby. He came back from overseas. He went back to his um, school where he went to La Perouse with the Ellers, and he said, guys, I want every kid here to run like the Ellers, play running rugby. A month later, he says, uh, running rugby is dead in Australia. We're going to kick the ball away to win. That's after one month. So why didn't he, when he came back to Australia, get some people together and say, guys, what is the situation on the ground? Where are we? You know, we're, what, what? and then he can say, well, actually, we're not where we should be. So, yeah, I'm going to take a young team away. We're really not going to compete in this World Cup. Um, but but Eddie's, you guys know Eddie, he loves the limelights. Uh, first game in South Africa, he left Australia saying, guys, this is going to be better than America's Cup. You know, it's going to be fantastic and all that. And the thing is, he put so much pressure on the young players, you know, and that's what Eddie does. He's done it all around the world, you know, and mm. it's okay if you've got experienced players, but um, he didn't have those players and look what happened, you know. They just couldn't, even against Wales, they could not understand. Like, it was just amazing. Wales were clinical. Um, I won't tell you the gentleman's name, but I spoke to one of the uh, – someone I know whose son plays for the Wallabies and he was at the game, the, the Welsh game. And he said he was in the stadium and he said all of a sudden Wales came out all together as a unit. You know, they they were high intensity work. He said the Wallabies came out in dribs and drabs. Wales went back to the dressing room all together. The Wallabies sort of wombled off. And he said to his wife, uh, I think we're in a bit of trouble here. And just from little things like that, you know, and unfortunately, my son was over there. He was watching in the grandstands and he said, Dad, he said, he said, even the Fiji, the Fijian game, Wales wanted it more. And in the Wales game, he said it was just, it just was sad, you know, and he's a 16 year old coming through the ranks, you know, and he sees that. So 
Gonna be scarred for life, unfortunately. Poor lad, that's that's brutal. I was I was sixteen when England got knocked out in the group stages, so I know exactly how it feels. <laughs> but we're but we're but we're all happy when England gets out there. That's good. Yeah, I was I was, hey, I was Campo, too happy. Make no mistake, we're all happy when Australia gets out. As well. <laughs> well, true, it's happened twice, and I was in one of the games in '95. So there we go. <laughs> Cam, oh, um, sorry, Nick. Go I on. Just wanted, I, I sorry, I just that. wanted to ask Campo uh, on the yep. point about Eddie Jones chopping and changing. I've read that he'd said somewhere um, that he made the decision after round two of the rugby championship to to go with that younger squad and to leave, you know, the likes of Cooper, Hooper, and uh, and Foley at home. Uh, why why do you think he was chopping and changing so much in the lead up to the World Cup? And how big of a mistake do you think it was to get rid of Dave Rennie? Yeah, look, I I, I don't know the Dave Rennie thing. You know, even I looked at Dave Rennie as, you know, I, I don't agree with a foreign coach in Australia. You know, you, the All Blacks will never get a Wallaby to coach. South Africa will never get a Wallaby or, or New Zealand to coach Springboks. It's a local South African. And once upon a time when we played, we all had a different style of playing rugby. That's how we won. You know, we played, we had great back lines. You know, we we played running rugby. We did the switches, the loops. We did all that fancy stuff, running different angles. Um, then professionalism came along and all of a sudden it's all about defence. Uh, Ireland's game is about defence. You know, if you have a look last year at the All Blacks, every time the All Blacks took the ball up to a ruck, they had four, four All Blacks on the ground. There was not one Irishman. So all of a sudden you've got 15 Irishmen versus 11 All Blacks. That's what they do. And... I think that Dave Rennie was, look, he was good, but he, the thing that disappoints me is he didn't want to know about Australian rugby. He he wanted to play Dave Rennie's rugby. We're Australians, you know, and that's where that's where we've ended up. We've ended up with no style at all. We do what like everyone else, mm. you know. We used to have some fantastic backs, individual backs, bit of flair, um, counter attack was to be out. We can't counter attack anymore. All it is, put it back. Guy gets it, runs it up like a rugby league player. I don't know why Eddie's got so obsessed with rugby league coaches. Mm. The coach for the attack in the Wallabies was a rugby league defence guy. Yeah. And a friend of mine who I know said, I didn't learn a thing from him. <laughs> and the this is professional. Time, Campo, you know? the last time you were on, you said, what does Eddie Jones know about back play? True. He was a hooker. He knows very, yeah. very little about it. And, um... But the thing is, you know. But if you look at you look at you watch the game now, and even again, um, a player that played in that game, he uh, against Fiji, he said there was opportunities there, but every time he called something, Karevi wouldn't pass the ball, and then in that last ten minutes, he wanted to attack, and the sideline said, "No, kick it down there. Let them make the mistake. That's negative football." Yeah. And every time, and I said to my wife, Lara, I said, every time Callaway gets the ball, he just runs it up. Mm. In the old days, you get it, you shift it, and off you go. So coaches, unfortunately, come in and play what they want. It's not necessary it's going to suit the pattern of play, but he's the coach, and we do what they tell us to do. Campo, look, Eddie has, you know, I mean, my view is is that he messed up massively with England after the uh, after the last World Cup. He's taken Australia um, to this World Cup. Some people would say, you know, uh, and I know Nick was making the point uh, previously that he had plenty of time to be able to uh, discern whether he should be uh, taking the old guys, the older guys. Yep. Uh, along to this World Cup or or, or uh, <laughs> new new broom stuff, he chose the new broom. Um, it didn't work. Um, look, he's a he's a coach who, in many ways, people there is you know a lot of people, and I, I I'd certainly say he's lost his way. Now, mm. there's obviously he's had the backing of McLennan and War publicly to continue. What are your yeah. thoughts about? I know he's a former teammate of yours and so on, yeah. but he, he, you know, his his track record is telling you and telling most people that at the moment he's probably not right for this job, this rebuild that you're talking about. 
So yeah, are I actually you backing heard... him or are you are you are you for him? No, I just think I heard before he got the Wallaby job that he's got the America job for 31 Olympics. Uh, sorry, the 31 World Cup. That's mm. what I heard before he got the job. Mm. So when he got the job, he did an interview with Florence Delalio about four months ago, saying in London with the Barbarian said. And Lawrence said, oh, mate, you got the Wallabies to the next World Cup. No, mate, no, I'm only here for a year. That's what he said. He said, win or lose. I've learned that, you know, if we win the World Cup, I'm gone. If we lose, you know, you, you just know that you can't stay. You don't stay long enough. I he think the, the reason same why... with England. He said he'd be on the beach. After the Yokohama final, he said, I'm going to the beach. I'm going to the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean... Yeah, but that's what 700,000 quid does, though, Nick, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, but it was interesting. I'll tell you interesting because I was at that uh, World Cup in uh, in Japan and I was there when England flogged New Zealand. Um, you know, it was very it was very tactical rugby. England played a really good style of rugby. They deserved to win. Anyway, the next day I was there for the Wales South African game. I don't know if you remember, it was boring as batching. It was I think yes. it was eight three at half oh. time. Anyway, anyway, uh, in comes Eddie Jones and Mitchell. And they had the world's biggest smile on their faces. And I've looked at them. I've gone, oh, dear. They've thought they've won the World Cup mm. because of what's happening. And I said to the guys, I said, mate, because I, I know John Mitchell as well. They don't smile. You've seen them never smile. And what happened the next week? Got their asses kicked. In a World Cup, you've got one good game. It's very difficult to try and keep it for the last game. Yeah. Um, but I just think the problem is now that we... And the reason why Eddie didn't take Hooper and Cooper, because I think Eddie wanted to control the young guys. He didn't want anyone in the team that had been around a while and sort of take the power away from him. And I think that's what happened. And unfortunately, look, it's sad where we are. McClellan, these guys aren't going to be accountable. They'll continue on like, oh, no, the plan's for the 27 World Cup. You know, it was all always like that. You know, we, we are in a mess, you know, and it has been a long time. I've been coaching since 2018 in Australia. I've gone right around the country. No kids know who we are. No kids know they don't watch rugby. And they've got no idea who a Wallaby is. So I've seen that, you know. and But they didn't listen to me because I'm, I'm from the uh, government school system. I'm not from the private school system, you know. And I've always been that way and I'm very outspoken. I've been cancelled by Rugby Australia. McClellan's cancelled me because of my views. So, you know, I all, all my podcasts, believe it or not, guys, I don't do anything in Australia. Everything's overseas. Nothing. So, so Campo, coming back to the to, to, to the real nub of this, Eddie mm -hmm. stays or Eddie goes for you? I reckon he should go, but he won't. He won't. Because he's got now he's got something to he's got something to aim for to prove to everybody that he wasn't just a big talker. And that's what I mean. If Portugal won and Fiji were out. And then, as I said, mate, that side of the draw, you'd never get an easier draw in your life in the World Cup. Never. How the IRB organised with four of the best countries this weekend playing against is, I've got no idea. Obviously, yeah. they're looking for the North Hemisphere teams to try and win something finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they've done a pretty good job at the moment, haven't they? <laughs> they have. Yeah, yeah you, could, you could have basically four... European teams this mm. week through, mm. yeah, and then, then everyone. Well, we'll go home. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, we're going to predict our quarterfinal winners in a second, um, and yeah. I reckon one or two of us will predict four Northern Hemisphere teams. Uh, just one more thing on Australia, Campo, and then we'll get on to looking ahead to the yeah. quarterfinals. Um, I asked you about this actually a couple of weeks ago, but what do you make of the JRFU allegations? You know, Eddie Jones said he didn't know what the journalist was talking about, and he said he took umbrage with what. They were questioning in him. What do you think? Well, first of all, do you believe the allegations? And if you do, what on earth is Eddie thinking taking an interview with the JRFU a couple of weeks before a World Cup? I don't think you guys realise. He's been in contact with Centauri for the last 20 years. I think he's still got a role there. He always has. Yeah. Um, it's not really going to affect the team because someone takes a phone call. It was just that they found out about it. McClendon came out afterwards and said, oh, yes, no, no, we knew there was a call. We knew that. But why didn't you come out firstly and say that? You know, and then Nettie says, no, I'm not going to answer more questions. He said, mate, it was organised through Rugby Australia. They knew everything. I've had a 20-year relationship with the Japanese. It's not nothing to do with the game. 
The players play the game. They're not going to be affected by a phone call. You know, if I was playing, who'd care? It's nothing to do with us. You know, so why? It, yes, it. I spoke to the journal and it's his credibility. He said the Sydney Morning Herald wouldn't put in the paper unless it was, it was true. So yeah, look, mate, it, it's we're all looking for something else to blame people. You know, the problem is that we we've stuffed up. The problem is we've gone to a World Cup with no goal kicker. That is number one. You don't go to World Cup with no goal kicker. You know that is number one. Eddie should know that as well. He should know. You got Foley over there. Um, you've got players over there with Australia A and he just he had picked the team and he had to put his head on on the chopping block. And ben as Tricks, I said, the guys He takes his eye off the ball, doesn't he, he Campo? You know, I mean he's you know, he's big sort of climbing into the journos and so on before they yep. before they leave, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And as you say, he doesn't there's a fundamental there. He took two scrum halves with England to um to the World Cup in Japan. You know, all the time there seem to be things that he overlooks. I mean, yeah. overlooking taking a, a, a goal kicker, a, a, you know, for for a coach of his standing, of mm. his reputation, is just, yeah. you know, I mean, in the end, he's got to be accountable, presumably. Well, I, I agree. We all agree. But nothing will happen in Australia because Hamish has got control. He doesn't care. So another rugby, an, another, another rugby championship where Australia, you know, fire blanks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he'll 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 remain, and and you think he'll see out the World Cup cycle to 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 twenty seven? No, I, I think he will because he's got nowhere to go. And McLennan's going to be. He wants to be sort of like the hero. I mean, it's it's sad that people are not accountable. Mm. You know, I mean. The other thing that's it's probably a bit different, but this is another big problem. You know, I was in Samoa uh, two days and I was on a panel and uh, a Fijian guy told me that the Fijian players get $500 a day to play in the World Cup. $500 a day. Australia are on about twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a test. I don't know how much England are. How is that fair in a Rugby World Cup? How You tell me, is that fair? Mm. How much is Portugal and Georgia getting paid? Isn't, isn't the World Cup supposed to be a professional sports? So, I mean, I was, I was gobsmacked, you know, and then I said, oh, if Fiji gets to the course, they might get $600 for the game. Wow. Because none of them are on contracts. But I'm just saying, is that really, are we professional? We're not professional. Rugby is not professional, especially after the Samoan score on the try, kicking the goal. Then the TMO said, oh, mate, we better go and have a look at that. I mean, really, it makes our sport sometimes look like it's, I don't know. It's a mess. It's a mess. Sorry. Yeah. No, that that was inside. Uh, that was a moment we hadn't mentioned earlier. Actually, the, it yeah. was embarrassing. That that was really embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, well, rugby's not going to be embarrassed because you got someone who's not even playing the game saying, "Oh, oh sorry, we better go ahead." Why couldn't they pick it up in the first time? They they show so many angles. And I think you it know? was 50, fifty cool anyway. Yeah, and I really think. hard school to to go back wait for the conversion yep. to be taken and then pull it up for a call that was so, yeah. you know, 50-50 was bizarre. If you're going really. to rule it out yeah. after the kick has been kicked, it's got to be a real... Yeah. Blunder, real it's got to be yeah, I, an absolute blunder, yeah, as you said. I thought that was the law. Once the kick goes over, but apparently they changed the law just before the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. Of course they did. Yeah. You oh. know, they've got to fix, think, think of everything, but that's why when you're trying to promote a sport around the world, people don't want to watch a TMO, people on TV in their little boxes looking at a screen. Who cares? We don't want to do that. We want to see rugby. You know, who are these people on the screen? Who want, Who cares? You know? Now, honestly, the game of rugby is about rugby. It's about the fans. If you haven't got fans, you haven't got a game. Mm. Yeah. You know? I guess it's a level of accountability, well, but I don't know. It, well, increasingly the accountability. It's not accountability with the TMO bunker, is it? Yeah, that's just, it. give it yellow, send them away, and then, then uh, and you know, it comes that's back. it. Using angles we don't point. see, a bloke we've never heard of, or a woman we've never heard of, anonymous in a bunker, 600 miles away at a tennis court, making decisions at inside the World Cup. Yeah. It's not working for me. And I, I thought it would work initially, but no, they, they just haven't got the protocols right. It, it's I not love working. It that they do it at Roland Garros. I've always imagined them sitting on one of those umpire chairs. 
looking at, <laughs> looking at us <laughs> with, with their little screen in front of them. Yeah. They're actually all just playing tennis mid-game and then they get yeah. a call. Oh, oh, like, oh. That's, that's, they're that's probably like, in the bar, are they? The tie break. <laughs> that's why it takes eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Right. Let's transition. It's not it's not the most seamless transition I've ever done, but it's called a final preview time. Um yeah. Look, I I don't I want to sell it properly. Like it's going to be a hell of a weekend. We've got four fantastic fixtures that, quite frankly, are almost well not impossible to call, but very difficult to call. And they're because of the yeah. nature of the draw, they're closer than most quarterfinals will be. Campo, which game stands out to you the most? Uh, look, I, I think it's uh, I think it's the two uh, Ireland, New Zealand, and South Africa and France. You know, will Dupont play? I suppose that's the question because he's he's a massive uh, asset to the team. Um, I watched South Africa uh, South Africa through the World Cup and you know they I think they've missed a couple of injuries like Mark's uh, gone home um, and they just don't seem to be not hungry but they just don't seem to be on form. France are playing probably the best style of rugby. Um, but again, you know, if Dupont's playing, not playing, do they rely on too much? And I don't think France have been under a lot of pressure yet. And I think South Africa's defence might put them under pressure. So, look, oh, I think it's, uh, as I said, I don't think if France can't win this World Cup at home, I think they'll struggle ever win a World Cup. You know, they've been in three finals already. So I think there's a lot of pressure and they know that. But they've performed so far. Um, I, I've, I've picked uh, South Africa by probably a point. Um, again, will will Rusty go for the seven one split? You've got Pollard back who doesn't miss shots a goal. You know, there's a lot of ifs and buts, you know. Um so that's what I did. But I think Ireland uh probably the form team. They've picked the same team, I think, every game, which is the best way the best way to go. Consistency, uh, familiarity, and you know, they're there for a reason. The All Blacks we saw last year in New Zealand Ireland win. Uh, by playing a very good defensive structure. Um, and what happened there put New Zealand under a lot of pressure. They had no game plan B, but this year they'll have to have a game plan B. And the only way for me to see to get the defence is uh, kick more. Kick more where they've got to say, will they run or will they kick? And they probably won't come up as quick and give them a bit more space. Uh, again, the All Blacks, who are you going to play at fullback? You've got McKenzie, who's a great player. You know, you've got Bowden Barrett, who's the next really number 10. Um, there's a lot of ifs and buts, you know. Um, and Ireland's probably got the most uh, balanced team. They've been there and they're on a mission. So I think Ireland will probably beat the All Blacks. Okay, so we've got two predictions there already. We've got South Africa to beat France and Ireland to beat the All Blacks. Okay, very good. So you've got one Southern Hemisphere, one Northern there. We'll get to everyone else in a second. Does anyone think Dupont won't play? Because I think he will. Oh, he'll undoubtedly play. I don't think there's ever been any doubt. Uh, you know, he's going to play. This yeah. is his moment. Um, Sean it, it Edwards, need a broken leg to stop him playing. Yeah, Sean Edwards has, has sort of tipped tipped the wink that um, he's he's ready to go. With a with a mask on or something like that, so yeah. all superheroes wear capes. <laughs> Sorry, that was yeah, he's a... gonna look with that mask. He's gonna look even more incredible, isn't he? Well, yeah, the even eyes on less him. Human. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's, Brendan. I want to come to you because you're always very good at selling the weekend. Um, France, South Africa. I want to start with. We obviously we reviewed it as one of the games of the year probably the game of the year back in November last year. This is going to be bigger, better, more furious, more atmospheric, same stadium, same superstars. It's just going to be wild. This is going to be rugby's greatest ever single occasion. I mean, can you just you know, just take yourself into it? Sunday night, France at home to the reigning world champion South Africa. It's going to be mental in Paris. It's going to be absolutely insane at the stade. And it's the old one, you know, who can handle the, the pressure the best, really? Forget the actual rugby contest between two outstanding teams. You, you've got to be able to keep your cool under that pressure. That's my only little thing against France. You know, they have been impressively disciplined under 
the new regime with one or two little lapses. But this is going to really test the temperament, I think. Um, I'm going to be a complete disgrace. As you know, I tip South Africa for the World Cup. I don't think they I think France, I just get that gut feeling that the force is with France. This DuPont story is the sort of stuff that motivates teams, squads, yep. nations, concentrates the mind. And I think they're going to get past South Africa. So you've gone back on your World Cup prediction. I've been a complete disgrace, but I mean, you have to reserve no. the right to do that. Call it hedging your bets. If I was on the race course, I'd be just laying off now. <laughs> You'd be cashing out early for a little, for the less big sum of money. Yeah. And as for Ireland, yes, I think they're going to beat New Zealand. Again, there's just that sort of energy and vibe about the Ireland story at the moment. Sexton, you know, every game is his last game. He seems to be having a superb tournament. Uh, it's a home game for Ireland, isn't it? It's going to be 65,000, that crowd are going to be Irish. In fact, yet again, <laughs> the Irish have done it. You know, Leinster always play at Aviva for the last five rounds of the Heineken Cup. Ireland are going to, you know, if they go all the way, we'll play the last five matches of the World Cup mm. at the Stad, which is more or less the Aviva. It's going to be 60,000 Irish fans. So I think they're going to get through that somehow. Epic match, another epic match. But I think they'll just find a way to beat New Zealand. <laughs> Is anyone predicting, well, actually, let's stay on France, South Africa. I'm going to come to the two next for your predictions. I'm going France because I backed them to win the World Cup at the start of this. Um, Kano? Yeah, I, 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 I back France, I'm pretty sure, as well. To win the World Cup, you did. So you're you're not doing a Brendan and going back on that completely. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, um, look, I, I just think that um, home advantage is huge the subliminal pressure yep. on referees um <clears throat> and the fact that france do you know they've got they they've got a cutting edge I, I think that the uh i think that the south africans probably have a slightly more powerful pack uh but i i i, I just think that the french will find a way to win it uh as i think they did in in marseille when the teams met a year ago pretty well and um so i take france to um to to win uh ireland new zealand i find a bit a bit more difficult um i, I ireland are definitely uh, you know definitely taken uh, form into this tournament they're playing very well um if there's a team who can sort of disrupt their pattern i think it's probably new zealand um but I, I, again, you know, I mean, I, I do think it will be like a home game for 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 the Irish, and um, so probably I'd take Ireland to to squeeze past New Zealand. I think it's a fair point that Ireland have very much made the Stade de France their own um, mm. over the last couple of weeks. We've obviously seen the whole cranberries thing playing after games, etc. And I think there's just a level of familiarity um, that. New Zealand may not be able to overcome. Uh, so, Nick, you've gone France and Ireland. Other Nick? Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. Um, I back France for the World Cup as well, not on the podcast, uh, but but somewhere <laughs> somewhere recorded. I, I think I did so. Uh, and then, um, but 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 with the France South Africa, game, that's an interesting one because I don't know how much that's expectation that's getting me to back France or hope. Um, it you know, South Africa's defense in the last well, in during the World Cup and in the lead up to uh to the World Cup itself as well ha was so strong and has been so strong. And that will be the real test for France, will be the fact that not every chance that they put together, not every bit of magic they produce is going to result in points necessarily. So, that you know, that their attitude has to be has to be you know they've got to put in a really determined effort but they've got Dupont back and they've got that home support so I think they'll get over the line um and then yeah Ireland New Zealand it's all about if 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 New Zealand can get some parity up front and that doesn't mean just at the set piece but at, at ruck at ruck time as well they have got a chance they have got a chance but I don't think at the moment that I think there's only really two other teams being France and South Africa who can really compete with Ireland up front because Ireland have got so much control 
in both attack and defence, that unless you can cause them a problem around the around the ruck area, which they've which they've done, you know, which uh, well they've kind of managed to get on the good side of referees, but that's kind of the control that they show that helps them with that. Um, unless you can do that, then it's very very difficult to compete with them. Very difficult. Okay, so we've got almost unanimous, but Campo, the dark horse, going South Africa against France. Still, still standing well, my, after hearing the guys. My wife's South African, so my son's South African, so I have to go, guys. Sorry. <laughs> you can just throw this, just throw it out there a bit, you know. <laughs> I mean, the thing, one of the things that uh, it's 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 quite interesting about these games. If you have a look, France played Italy and won easily. You know, when you go to a World Cup, you don't want an easy game. You want because you, you only play as well as your opposition let you play, you know. And I think that South Africa is not going to let France run like what they did against Italy. Uh, you know, they think that because it happens one week, it's not going to happen the next. And Ireland played Scotland and won fairly easily. Uh, and the All Blacks had a, a pretty easy game as well. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, they're going to try things and it's not going to work, you know. And the thing that I still believe in rugby is, if you haven't got the ball, you can't win. Teams love kicking the ball away, hoping the other team makes a mistake, you know, and that's going to be the problem uh, going into this uh, this next couple of weeks um, because some of these teams have not had a lot of pressure put on them. And all of a sudden you've got a defence right in your face for 60 minutes and you've got nowhere to go. That's when you start to panic and that's where you just kick the ball away for the sake of kicking. That that could be a problem for New Zealand, couldn't it, Cambo? Because except for that opening match against France, obviously, they haven't really had a match in a month. And they've oh. been here before in these World Cup situations. They just romp through the pools. And in effect, they've yep. romped through this pool, except for that first match. Yep. They suddenly come up against heavyweights in the, in the quarterfinal. And it takes a bit yep. of transitioning. And they don't always do it. Yep. Well, if you think about, just say, Portugal won by more than seven. Australia go through. They haven't played a game in two weeks. <laughs> How are you going to turn up and play against um, who, who play? England or after having a two-week break? How does that work? Yeah, did, did anyone see that photo, that photo online, which is a picture of Eddie Jones running, and it said, Eddie Jones running to the pub to tell the players to get back to the hotel halfway <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through the uh, <laughs> Portugal Fiji game. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But anyway, so, yeah, uh, look, it's going to come down to Ireland wanted more. Well, you can see the way they play. Again, I still believe you only play as well as the opposition lets you play. If there's going to be defence, they're just going to knock you down, knock you down, and you haven't got a game plan B, well, you're in a lot of trouble. And I think that's the All Blacks' main problem against Ireland. Yeah. On, well... Probably moving down a notch in quality, but certainly not in terms of contest. <laughs> the other side of the That's draw. Not... This is a professional era. Come on. We're all, <laughs> all equal. <laughs> I'm more than happy to put myself on the chopping block and say that one side of the draw is of higher quality than the other. But Wales, yeah. Argentina, England. Yeah, yeah. England and Fiji. England, Fiji, Wales and Argentina's side of the draw is just so much stronger. <laughs> 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 Although, as I argued the other day, a lot of the entertainment and engagement oh, and best matches have come from the weaker side of the pool, haven't they? Oh, yeah. pool, the pool, other... C, pool C has been the most entertaining pool. Oh, for a long time. Yeah. The biggest winning margin by by a distance was Australia-Wales in that pool. All the other <laughs> games were really close. <laughs> but, I mean, but the thing is, if you have a look at... And the reason is, you look at Georgia and Portugal, mate, they... they for them to be in a World Cup for Portugal first, mate, they they want to go away from the experience saying this we've tried our best. You know, and that's that's what people don't understand. A World Cup is for the players, it's an unbelievable opportunity. You know, just remember, like you think of it, some people have never been to a rugby world cup as a player. Mm. You know, that's what we've got to realise is they they stood up to be counted. They said, guys, they played a great style of rugby. Um and they realised they had one opportunity. That's why that pool was the easiest pool, really, to get through. And you got Australia, the T1 country, couldn't make it. That's, what, that's the worst, the saddest thing about it. 
You know, the, the other teams, like Australia, Georgia, they should have won by 60 points. And I think that was an indication like, Georgia, you beat by 37 points? Like, you know, that's 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 just uncounter. That's, you don't think of things like that. As an Australian, you should go over there and just flog them. But that's, that's what I mean. That's why it was so close because the other teams decided to play a style of rugby and they were bloody – the skills were amazing. And I, I think that's why it was so difficult – and that's where Australia thought it was going to be a lot easier than what it, what it turned out to be. So, Campo, who are you predicting out of England, Fiji, Wales, Argentina? Well, I'd love to see Fiji win. I love the English that much. <laughs> that mean you think Fiji um, will win? I think the English have got a lot of problem with uh, Farrell. I think they should have just left him at home after that red card. I mean, Ford played really well in the first game against Argentina. Um, you know, against Samoa, it was pretty close. Pardon me. Um, I, I think, look, realistic, I think England's going to win because they're going to play a very boring game of rugby just to get the points, get out of there and go again. Um, and if Fiji want to turn up and play like they did against Wales and that, I think it's going to be a, a bloody great good a game. But again, you know, I just, I just dislike referees in games like this because certain teams get advantage of more than other teams. I mean, I've always believed that in rugby. Uh, but I think England will, I mean, I just think they've just, they've realised they got beat by Fiji a couple of weeks ago. It's not going to happen again. I think that woke them up and they think they know how to beat Fiji. So I, I'd pick, um, I'd love, really love Fiji to win, but I can't really see them after the last couple of performances. So I reckon England's, Wales, Argentina, um, again, Wales are very clinical. They've got two world-class goal kickers. Argentina's got world-class goal kickers, but I don't know the discipline of the Argentinians. Uh, that lets them down a lot. And again, if you've got a, a, wrong, a referee that's on the wrong side of the fence, I mean, you're going to get blown off the paddock. You know? So I, I think that um, I think I'd, I'd love to see Argentina because I know Czech very well. I mean, he's done pretty well. Um, actually, I'll, yeah. Actually, I'll change my mind. I think I'll go Argentina by three points. Okay. Okay. So you've gone two north, two south is your... <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've gone two north and two south as your semi-finalists. Yep. Okay. Yep. Nice divide. Let's go. We'll go in the same order. Brendan? Um, as alluded to earlier, I, I think Fiji are just beginning to run out of steam a little bit. Um. And I think England will grind out a win. Uh, and then we get to the Campo situation about every team has got one really big performance in them at a World Cup. If England reduce that performance in the semi-final, they could be one of the most unlikely finalists in history. Um, so, But, but that's, that's the way the draw has been. You know, it's always been the case that if England suddenly got hot for one match, they could go a long <laughs> way in this tournament. So that, I think, I hope it's a really good match. I hope Fiji give a great account of themselves. I just think they're running out of steam. I think Argentina are going to beat Wales. They were having a very, very ordinary World Cup. And then they suddenly sparked up against Japan. They suddenly realised they got two or three outstanding backs. I don't know why they've been hiding Matteo Carreras on the wing. I mean, he's world class. And the crowd got going. And just the vibe, the whole vibe at the end of that match from the Pumas was different than going into it. And I think they play a lot of very high quality rugby in the Southern Hemisphere Championship. I think they'll be, I think they'll beat Wales. Um, so I don't know where that leads me. Is that is that am I? I'm three north yep. and one south. Is it correct? Yeah, you've gone. Ar Argentina is your only south. Okay, so not a whole. So we're yet to have anyone say four north. Is that about to change, Kano? Um. Yeah. Oh come on. Yeah. <laughs> come on. Make it I think so. <laughs> I think so. Four north. Look, it's got to be full north. <laughs> full north power. Um. England, Fiji, I, you know, I mean, look, look, I, I say it with not a great deal of confidence. Let me put it that way. They're both, all, every single side in that, the most consistent side during the World Cup has been Wales. Yes, so I agree. You, you, you take Wales to beat Argentina on that because Argentina are bloody inconsistent. Um, they've come into a good game against Japan in a, in a, in a, you know, in a pretty loose game. Um, but I just think when the pressure's on, I mean, they're capable of beating Wales. There's no question about that, but I, I don't think that they will. 
um, in this instance. And um, England, Fiji, uh, I, I think that the Fijians like, you know, as we discussed earlier on, I think that they are, you, you know, they haven't got better as the tournament's gone on. Mm -hmm. They look tired, um, yeah. but they are a side who can, you know, pull the rabbit out of the hat. There's no question about that. England, um, England's advantage over them is that I don't think that Fiji will defend the England lineout as well as Samoa did. And if England's lineout gets traction against Fiji, England will beat Fiji if their yeah. driving ball gets traction because they'll kick for the corner and and try and you, you know rumble over. Yeah. So if if that happens. Uh, which I fear that it will. Um, I think that England will win it and uh, progress as one of the luckiest semi-finalists <laughs> that there would be. Can I exactly. add one more thing about the Pumas? Because they lost that first match against England, they've been playing knockout rugby ever since. So they're well mm. tuned up for this sort of knockout winner-takes-all scenario, which obviously the quarterfinals immediately become. Um, so, you know, it's going to be very, very close. That might just give them a bit of an edge. Wales have sort of been not in cruise control. They've just been in, in total control of their pool, really. And suddenly they're going to come up with this, you know, the big knockout match. So we'll see how they react to that. But as I said, I think the, the, the biggest concern is when you go to these World Cups is that you've had two easy games, then you come up against the defence. It's not going to let you do anything, hmm. you know. And the Argentinians... If you have a look at the way they've played, you know, even Japan were very disappointing from 2019 to now. They weren't anywhere near. Um, and as I, you know, I keep on saying, you only play as well as the opposition let you play. If they want to turn up, you're in big trouble. If they don't turn up, as again, as I said, you, you know, the pressure also, when when you get into these, this is this is a lot of pressure as well. You know, England's under pressure because they haven't been playing great rugby. Uh, Fiji's probably got nothing to lose because they've never been in a situation like this. So you've got to take those little things into consideration. You know, France, home, 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 home World Cup. Can you imagine the pressure on them if they make a mistake and lose? You know, they're going, oh, sheesh, we'll get kicked out of the country. So those little things do add up. And then, unfortunately, you've got the man in the middle. Who knows what can happen with decisions, you know? And that's that's what I mean. That's where rugby is so different these days. You've got a lot of different things to look at. And I, I just hope that it's there's no controversy. The best teams win because that's what we want to see. We want to see a World Cup with the best teams who deserve to be there. And as I said, you've got one good game in you in a World Cup. If you do it now, you, you've still got the semis next the week after. so And the final after that. So it's still a long way to go. Nick Powell, round us up. Well, actually, I haven't given mine. I'm going all four north. And I'll, I'll, I agree with you about everything. There's got to be one. Are, nah. are, you leaving, are you just going to leave it there? Just all yeah. four north? I'm, uh, yeah, well, Campo gave For obvious Nick reasons, is it, Ollie? <laughs> yeah, all the reasons that have been said. Campo gave Nick a hard time for sitting on the fence. I'm being blunt. All four north. Okay. Powell, Good luck. are you the same? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Powell, are you the same? I'm 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 backing England again. This one's entirely out of hope. Uh because I've organized a, a social at my local rugby club for the semi-final that England are due to be in. So if they lose, it's a complete disaster for me. Uh and and, and well, also support Fiji at the social. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. We can have, we can all turn up and support Fiji, but um yeah, I I, I think England if you'd asked me before Fiji and Portugal had faced off, then I would have leaned towards Fiji. Um, but I think England, there are just there's so many, as great a game as it was, and as much as I thought they brought to that game, Fiji, they made so many glaring errors in that game that England, if they if they do any decent analysis on, will be able to unpick a lot of holes. Um, and, and I do totally agree with Brendan's point about burnout as well. I think they are starting to revert to some of the old problems that they had. Ill discipline, overplaying it, then panicking and underplaying and relying on power up front. And I think England will have too much for them. Well, say too much. England will have just enough for them. Um, 
And then Wales, Argentina. Warren Gatlin's record is exceptional in, in World Cup quarterfinals, um, p- particularly recently. Um, obviously lost in 2015, but that was with so many Welsh injuries against a, a good South African side. Uh, I, I just don't see the consistency from Argentina at the moment. Even, you know, I, I appreciate that they've had three effective knockout games in the lead up to this and they're, you know, they might be might be prepared, but you know, can't forget that they beat England last year in the Autumn Internationals and then the following week went down to a, a really poor defeat at yeah. the Principality Stadium against Wales. Um, and I just don't think their consistency is going to be there. And I think Wales' defence is going to be a lot, lot stronger than Japan's was on uh, on Sunday. So, yeah, in a very, very roundabout way, I'm saying the two Northern Hemisphere nations, which gives me all four Northern Hemisphere nations as well. The three of us have all four Northern Hemisphere nations. So we've got unanimous Ireland, unanimous England, 3-2 in favour of Wales, and 4-1 in favour of France. I look forward to this time next week when we come back on our semi-finals of Fiji, Argentina, South Africa, and the All Blacks. (laughs) (laughs) Cracking semi-finals, to be fair. (laughs) Yeah, we we take it as a spectacle. Not as journalists, we wouldn't, but hey-ho. Um, David, just very quickly before we go, who's going to win the World Cup from here? Mm, Australia. <laughs> oh, come on. That's that's really sad for you to say that. <laughs> At least we England won. <laughs> um, um, I think South Africa. South Africa. Okay, very, very good. Well, that's I can't remember who said South Africa. Well, you're replacing Brendan then, who has now nailed his um what the, whatever the expression he is. He hasn't nailed any colours. <laughs> <in> the complete <laughs> opposite. <laughs> I've ripped my colours from the mask. <laughs> he's nailed. He's nailed his colours to every mast in the yeah. port. <laughs> yeah. Very much sitting on the feds. Right, Campo. I wish you well. You said you're going back to France tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Singapore tomorrow for two days in France on the 15th. So we'll be there when we won't be at Marseille. We'll yeah. be heading off to for a couple of days, my wife and my daughter. So oh, fantastic. Then we're in Paris for days, yeah. So are you going to any of the, not quarters by Ooh. that, but semi-finals? Yeah, got the semis, uh, third and fourth, which will be riveting, and uh, the final. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why you want to play third and fourth. No one cares, really. It doesn't affect... you Argentina. They, they produced their best ever performance, didn't they, in the, the playoff? The best thing ever, the next World Cup, Australia, do not have to qualify because it's in Australia. How lucky is that? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we'll wrap up there, Campo. Thanks so much again. It's been great having you. Okay. The rugby just keeps on coming at the moment and the Guinness Six Nations is just around the corner and will be upon us before we know it. Make it a year to remember by booking official hospitality with our friends at Keith Prowse, principal sales partner to England Rugby Hospitality. Their matchday experiences have a whole range of incredible features from complimentary bars to menus designed by Michelin star chefs, namely Tom Kerridge, Ollie Dabu and Tommy Banks. So book your experience now and make memories that will last a lifetime. Visit keithprowse.co.uk forward slash Twickenham now. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day. <laughs>